All rise. The Court of Appeals, Division One, is now in session. Please be seated. Good morning. I think we're still in morning. I. Uh, but, but, yeah, but we'll say good morning. Um, we're here today uh, for argument in Freer v. Uh, Clifton Larson Allen, uh, case number CV 210491. Uh, uh, each party has 20 minutes uh, for your argument. You can reserve just if you could keep that your track of that yourself. Um, there's a clock on the podium. Uh, proceedings are being recorded, so please introduce yourself at the outset of your your argument. Um, we've read the briefs, discussed the case, and with that, counsel, you may proceed. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Joseph Schenk. Uh, I'm appearing here before you on behalf of Appellant Jeremy T. Freer, and I am once again before this court seeking to overturn an erroneously granted summary judgment motion uh, by the Superior Court. Um, in this instance, Superior Court ruled that uh, Mr. Freer um, was not damaged by his reliance upon uh, the Clifton Larson Allen, which I'm going to call CLA, uh, audit report uh, because uh, uh, and, and then because he wasn't personally damaged, he, he therefore lacked standing to pursue his negligent misrepresentation claim. And uh, what I'd like to do is start out with just a brief summary of the facts relevant to uh, Mr. Freer's negligent misrepresentation claim. In February 2014, CLA admits that it provided to Mr. Freer a copy of an audit report that audited the 2013 financial statements of JTF Aviation Holdings. But technically, CLA provided that copy of the audit report to JTF, while, while in reality, Mr. Freer was effectively JTF at that moment. Uh, he was the physical person who would receive the physical report. He was standing in the shoes of a corporation that contracted for the audit report, correct? Not, not, I, I disagree, Your Honor. He got a copy of the report in his individual capacity. Okay. He received this report as a result of a December 2013, I want to say, engagement letter. Does Mr. Freer's signature appear on that letter? No. So he did not contract for that audit report. JTF did. Correct. And so JTF received the audit report as a result of that engagement letter. No, he also received a copy of it. In fact, it's not even disputed. They admit in their facts that, he, that they provided a copy to him, although they say that it was provided to him in his capacity as a shareholder. I mean, that's I, I, not an official capacity. That's him as an individual. But, Counselor, you're not arguing every, everyone who was CC'd as a, a claim for negligent misrepresentation. Only those who relied on it to their detriment, Your Honor. Okay, well, you just said he was sent it, so that's why I'm trying to... Uh, he, he so to that point isn't the definitive point you're going to go forward and you're going to explain how he relied on it. Correct. Okay. And, 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 and as I say, don't even, they don't even contest the fact that he received a copy of the report. Uh, is it, isn't the test not just reliance, but whether or not he was a foreseeable person to, to rely on the report? I think the test is whether he is someone who they reasonably knew or expected would receive and rely upon a copy. Yes. Okay. And in this case, uh, the audit report, first of all, that he was provided stated that the financial statements, the 2013 financial statements of JTF Aviation Holdings were both accurate and GAAP compliant. CLA also admits that it knew that the audit report might be used in connection with the sale of JTF Aviation Holdings. Let, 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 let's jump back to your reliance uh, argument. So you, you rely heavily on Standard Charter. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And if you look to Standard Charter and, and you look at, um, where's the paragraph? Um, Okay, well, I'll just read the, the, the section. Here's what it says. I think, think the relevant part. It is enough 
that the maker know that the recipient intended to supply the information for the benefit of a limited group or class and a member. So it seems as if the critical word is, words are for the benefit of. Okay. So isn't that the lens through which we would apply standard charter? I think so. And I think it absolutely is perfectly applicable here because Mr. Freer wore a lot of hats. In addition to being the sole shareholder of JTF Aviation Holdings, the company that CLA knew was going to be sold, he also was the president and CEO of JTF Aviation Holdings, a person who they knew might well rely on that audit report in making decisions on behalf of the company. So isn't that key though? Decisions on behalf of the company as opposed to decisions on behalf of him as an individual? Well, because he got it in two capacities. I say he got it as the president and CEO and might rely upon it in his capacity as an officer of the company, but he also got it as the sole shareholder of the company. And he is the ultimate person as a sole shareholder who's going to make the decision about whether or not JTF Aviation Holdings was going to be sold and if it was going to be sold for what price. So I have, I think, a relatively simple question. And it sort of dovetails off of your earlier litigation in the Supreme Court in which I think Freer couldn't run faster from JTF and wanted to show a chasm such that he could move forward. Here we have something different. So my question is, the contract between CLA and JTF, the absence of a line for Freer, does that provide any insight into the mind of here, the maker, as to who would be, to use your words, relying on it or would benefit from it, especially given the course of this lawsuit? No, I think that's absolutely incorrect, Your Honor, and I'll tell you why. The case Standard Chartered versus Price Waterhouse, the plaintiff in that case, Standard Chartered, was not the company that was audited by Price Waterhouse. It was the company, actually the successor or the parent company of the bank that bought the company audited by Price Waterhouse. So to draw an analogy, it was in the position of the buyer of JTF Aviation in this case. Right. I don't know if that helps. Well, it does because it shows that, you know, I guarantee you that buyer was not on the engagement letter between... Certainly. Right, right. And that's what Standard Chartered is. I mean, that's what it stands for. But the buyer in a proposed transaction who will rely on financial statements to make a decision, yes or no, is different than the owner, completely different side, of the seller. How do you get over there? Because I think... When he's not even... I mean, I think they're in the contract. I think they're in exactly the same position because, as you say, the buyer is making a decision relying upon the audited financial statements about whether to buy and how much. Jeremy Freer, in this case, was relying upon the audited financial statements to determine whether to sell or not and at what price. I think their positions... I think that Jeremy Freer's position in this case is basically the other side of the transaction from Standard Chartered in the sense that they're both parties to a business transaction trying to make informed decisions based upon financial statements, which they believe to be accurate because they've relied on an audit report. Right. So here's my difference and why I was talking about that contract theory is because JTF, if that's the acronym, signed that contract. I think it was the COO who signed it. Yes. If... Did JTF just make a mistake here in not including another line? I mean, we have to assume this is a rational economic actor. And if they would have just put another line, Freer, 
wouldn't they have done that if the maker, again, under the restatement, was thinking here, Mr. Freer might rely on this. Did they just make a poor decision in not adding him to the agreement? I don't think so, no more than they made a poor decision in standard charter by not including the name of the potential buyer as someone who would be interested in their financial statement. You're saying they're one. I mean, Freer and Jake, I mean, that's different, right? I mean, what, are you going to go out and find prospective purchasers to sign it? Here, it's JTF and its sole owner. Well, I think the difference is that the buyer ends up in the asset protection, asset purchase agreement. There was a gap warranty where they basically made the seller warrant that the financial statements were accurate and gap compliant as represented in the audit. So, again, I think that, you know, you're struggling to find a difference here that I don't think exists between the position of Mr. Freer as the decision maker on the seller side and standard charter as the decision maker on the buyer side of a transaction. And in each instance, those are non-clients of the accounting firm who are relying upon the audit. So they are within the reasonable group, limited group of people who are, you know, that CLA knows or expects will rely on their work. Which begs the question, if they foresaw that, why don't you have Freer sign below JTF on the engagement letter? I mean, how? Unless they're not rational. Well, if you want to talk about a hypothetical case. It's not hypothetical. Sure it is. Because if they have put him on there. He's JTF's sole owner. JTF signed the engagement letter. Right. And they didn't ask and they didn't have Mr. Freer sign the engagement agreement. And we can do another hypothetical. If they had asked him and he had signed it, maybe he would have filed his then professional negligence and negligent misrepresentation claims against CLA within the two-year repose provision in the engagement agreement. So maybe he would have acted differently. Right. But we're looking at, I think, the maker, right? I mean, that's what the law tells us. CLA, who they reasonably, well, foreseeability is, after key laws, sometimes a bad word. But, well, how does key laws affect your case? Key laws, what is that? It says we don't, what's the Supreme Court case says we don't follow the restatement second on, well, okay. Go ahead. So in any event, and aside from standard charter, you have this restatement provision, 902, that basically they relied on for holding it. And there's not been any subsequent, you know, Supreme Court case overturning standard charter as, you know, valid precedent on this very issue. And so if you get past the fact that he was someone who could reason. In what way did Freer as an individual rely on the audit report, separate from his role with JTF? Well, he personally signed the asset purchase agreement. And also he made the decision. In his personal capacity? He sold, he personally sold the assets of JTF personally? No, you asked, he signed the. Yeah, let me make that a little bit more clear. I'm sorry if I was unclear. As an individual and not in his capacity with JTF. Sure. In what way did he rely on it? He signed the asset purchase agreement twice. He signed it once as the president and CEO. He signed it in his official capacity for JTF Aviation Holdings. He signed it a second time in his individual capacity. You mean as a shareholder? Yeah, but that's an individual. I mean, you own stock as, you know, that is not some derivative of the company. You own stock, owning stock doesn't make you a representative of the company. I own stock in GM, but that doesn't make me, you know, acting in a representative capacity. I understand, but it brings up the next point, which is that shareholders generally don't have a claim for action to the. I didn't, you know, if you, you know, I didn't have a chance to go through my facts, but I was going to go through the facts of this case just to point out that not once do I rely on him being a shareholder for the facts supporting our claim. Because as we know that in June of 2014, Mr. Freer and JTF entered into the asset purchase agreement. In September of 2014, 
Mr. Freer was personally sued in his individual capacity as a defendant in the Delaware lawsuit by the buyer. And the buyer alleged that both he had breached the gap warranty in the asset purchase agreement and that he had misrepresented the financial condition of JTF Aviation in the asset purchase agreement. Those were claims that were served against him in the original complaint. Mr. Freer, as a result of being sued individually in a Delaware lawsuit, then had to go out and hire, in his individual capacity, legal counsel to represent him in the case. He later... Did not JTF and the insurance company from JTF pay for that counsel, or at least the vast majority of those costs? Well, let me finish my... I will get right back to it. The answer is yes, but it didn't pay for all of it. Because in addition, Mr. Freer... I'm sorry. I see you have five minutes, but can you indulge me? And what is your best case for application of the collateral source rule outside of where there's personal injury? What's your best case for that? Well, I believe that the best case is that the cases in Arizona applying and accepting the collateral source rule rely on the restatement provision dealing with that. And the restatement provision makes it clear. The comments... Section 920, comments one and two, I believe, state that collateral sources can include such things as the tortfeasors, the plaintiff's employer, whether it's gratuitous or by contract that they cover the loss, and also insurance companies, whether the premiums are paid by the plaintiff or by a third party. Those are the comments. I'm aware of that. I'm saying like all the cases that I've seen and that I'm aware of, there is some sort of injury involved, some sort of personal injury. So I'm asking for your best case where there was no personal injury and the collateral source rule was applied. I could provide the court with one. I just don't have one. And I would point out that this case that we have is not a contract case. It is a tort case. We are basing our claims against CLA on a negligent misrepresentation claim, and it is based on standard charter and the restatement of torts, and that the provisions dealing with the collateral source also come from the restatement of torts. And I'd like to point out, because they make a lot of arguments, and I don't know if I'm going to have time to deal with them now, but they had made a number of arguments as to why the collateral source rule shouldn't apply here. You can be assured we've read all the briefing and we've talked it all through, like I said at the outset. So don't worry about not having time to tell us facts. Okay. Well, in any event, the collateral source rule should apply here. And the problem is that there's been no evidence. And this case was decided in an unusual procedural context. Once we were, the case was remanded back to the Superior Court by the Supreme Court. We're in the midst of the COVID protocols. It's hard to get discovery done. And we came up with a clever idea of at least trying to, we did a mediation, and it was clear from the mediation that CLA was relying very heavily on the no damage issue. And so we thought maybe we could resolve the no damage issue with a stipulated set of facts, and then we got what we got. But it's, the fact of the matter is, I did want to make one clear point, and that is that in their pleadings below, CLA filed in a separate statement of facts, it acknowledged that Mr. Freer had produced, quote, documents, close quote, showing that he personally paid approximately $40,000 towards litigation fees and expenses. And that's at the reference, the index of the record 140, paragraph 21. And I think that's a key point, because if you accept their own acknowledgement that there's evidence that he had out-of-pocket losses as a result of being sued in Delaware, the rest of the negligent misrepresentation case is either established or subject to unresolved factual disputes. 
not something on which they could have reasonably granted summary judgment. So, you know, we're now really not talking about should the court have granted summary judgment, but rather, you know, how should it have ruled on, you know, what the damages limit would be? Because I would say that, you know, the general rule is that damages are a question of fact for the jury. And in this case, we didn't have a jury. And someone is going to have to make a determination of how much of the defense costs paid by Chubb Insurance should be allocated to the defense of Mr. Freer versus JTF Aviation. And then how much of the settlement payment made to resolve the claims against the two of them should be allocated to the dismissal of claims against Freer versus the dismissal of claims against JTF Aviation. And I'll reserve my 30 seconds. Thank you, counsel. May it please the court. My name is Taylor Steiner, and I represent Clifton Larson Allen LLP. With me today is Kelly Hedberg, my local counsel, and Charles Jones from Clifton Larson Allen, who is Clifton Larson Allen's general counsel principal. I want to start out by addressing some of the questions that your honors raised today to my opposing counsel. And I first want to talk about the standard charter case. The standard charter case does not address the issue of shareholder standing. What it addresses is the expansion of an accountant's potential duty to those in which it's not in privity with. But duty and standing are not the same thing. But why doesn't it extend to Mr. Freer? I mean, standard charter, you would agree with me, extended liability beyond what had existed the day before standard charter. Yes, I agree. So why isn't Mr. Freer in that expansion? Because even if an accountant owes a third party a duty, it does not mean, or Mr. Freer would then still need to prove that he suffered harm from a breach of that duty and that he is standing to sue for that harm. Here, Mr. Freer has not proven he suffered harm, and he has not proven he suffered an injury that's separate and distinct from the injury suffered by the corporation. So the focus is different. So is your argument, I mean, you keep saying standing. And so I think standing, there are two kinds. You have constitutional standing, and then you have this messy kind of closeness standing. Here, isn't your argument that under the restatement, a certain group is authorized to sue and obtain damages, not so much standing? I mean... Well, the argument is that the Section 552 extends the potential accountant's potential duty to additional class of members. But what it doesn't do is say that shareholders who don't suffer a harm can still sue. That shareholder still needs to meet all the other requirements to prove a claim. No, I understand that, but go ahead. I just want to clarify, my understanding is Mr. Freer is not pursuing this claim as a shareholder, but is attempting to draw some nonetheless distinction between his corporate role and his personal role. Is there a case that you're aware of that engages with this sort of fact pattern where there's a sole owner for the corporation? There is. I mean, there's a lot of cases that talk about this specific instance. There's the Elbers case, the Schroeder case, Gemstar, Funk, Hildalgo. What's your best case? Right, all of these cases say that even if there's a sole shareholder in a corporation that holds all the stock in the company, he still cannot sue, A, for a reduced value of shares, and also for an injury to the corporation. And Arizona law is very clear when it says that an injury in the form of a reduced share value is an injury to the corporation, not the shareholder. Okay, and then sort of the earlier point on the role that Mr. Freer played is the Kiroz. Well, let me ask you that. Are you familiar with the Kiroz case? I am not. Okay, so that probably won't work. It's a quite significant tort case here in Arizona. A few years ago, our Supreme Court rolled back a reliable use of foreseeability in the context of duty in tort cases. Nonetheless, we do have these cases adopting 552, and it talks about foreseeable recipients in this account of context. Could you talk to me a little bit about this, what I see as sort of a threshold issue, whether or not Mr. Freer falls into that recipient category? I mean, there's sort of a, 
um, logic to, although it was JTF, how would CLA not have seen Mr. Freer as the logical recipient and reliant on the audit report? Well, that brings up another point here, because Mr. Freer did not rely on the audited financial statements for any, any purpose in his personal capacity. He, JTF sold its assets, JTF made warranties, and JTF relinquished money from the escrow account. Freer did none of those things. So there isn't that reliance piece there. Um, and, you know, I do want to point, Your Honor, to the Gemstar case, where it, it talks specifically about the interconnectedness between 552 and this issue of standing. And I want to quote from it because it's very important. The Gemstar court said that recognizing that liability no longer depends on privity does not answer the question of who has standing to sue for a corporate injury. And, he, and in that case, just like here, the shareholders did not have a separate injury from the corporation. So let, let me, let, let's go to that, that point again, which is what, what, what you're calling standing. Okay, so, so this is what Standard Charter says. It says, it is enough that the maker, your client, know that the recipient, italicized, intended to supply the information for the benefit of a limited group or class, blah, blah, blah. Why didn't your client as the maker supply this for the benefit of Mr. Freer? I mean, if, if that's, that's what the case says. Right, he didn't, it's the, because the only purpose that CLA was aware of was the asset sale. They knew that JTF was going to be selling its assets. It did not understand that Freer was selling anything or making any sort of warranties whatsoever. Just JTF was the one that was engaging in the asset sale. Um, I also wanted to address the collateral source rule. Um, and um, I know Council talked about that a little bit. The collateral source rule doesn't apply here for a, for a number of reasons. First of all, um, Mr. Freer was not injured for the reasons we talked about. The reduced share value is not um, an injury to the shareholder. It's an in, injury to the corporation. And I want to make it very clear that this possible small amount of cost that Mr. Freer claims to have made, there's no proof in the record that that's actually that he actually incurred those costs. The, the, the section he's relying on from the stipulated statement of facts says that Mr. Freer claims to have personally paid some of those costs. Claiming to have personally incurred costs and actually proving that you've done that at the summary judgment st stage are two different things. You cannot, uh, uh, you know, case law is clear and so is the Rule 56 of the Arizona Rules of Civil Procedure. You can't rely on mere vermins of fact. You have to actually show the court, here's my evidence that I personally incurred some costs. So first of all, the collateral source rule, which generally applies only when a party's been injured and receives compensation, doesn't apply here because Mr. Freer wasn't injured. Second, the rule doesn't apply because it's actually a question of logic. Mr. Freer claims that the payments of these costs and the payment of the settlement payment is his injury, but at the same time he's claiming it's compensation for his injury. It can't be both. It has to be the injury or compensation for the injury. Third, um, we cited some case law um, in our brief regarding the fact that um, this case requires, or collateral source for it to apply, it typically applies in, to an innocent victim. You have a plaintiff who was injured in a car accident, for example, totally innocent, not the person's fault, and then receives money from medical insurance, for example. That's not the case. The case that we have here is that Mr. Freer was alleged to have committed fraud in connection with JTF's asset sale, and then he was also wrongfully sued um, for a breach of warranty he didn't make. So he's an intentional tort feeser here, and he's trying to essentially get indemnification or contribution from CLA um, in the form of collateral source, and that's just not allowed under Arizona law. So, so going back, so you're saying in the record there is no evidence that Freer ever said, by the way, I'm going to be using this as well on my own side transaction. But if he did, you're saying that would be for, for his benefit and he'd have a cause? 
I think the restatement extends to certain groups that are that can be essentially reasonably rely on an audit report. If he's in that group, is that what you're asking? If he had a separate engagement? I mean, first of so, all, I, I'm just looking at, at standard charters language, which says it draws the contrast. There's two sentences in one in one paragraph where it says um, uh, we're not at uh, we're this doesn't happen, and, and this doesn't happen is, uh, oh, mere foreseeability, you expected sooner or later, it, that's not enough. Right. But then it flips, and, and it says, it says that you look and you ask if the maker knew that recipient, uh, so here, uh, so many acronyms, JTF, intended to supply the information for the benefit of, and then what you just said, the limited group of. Okay, so if, if, if your client had that knowledge, is that enough to, to make it, uh, I guess, standing as you're calling it? You have standing? No, it's not enough because then again, that only extends to the element of duty. So if, for example, CLA knew that Mr. Freer was going to rely on the financial statements in connection with some other transaction. That's part of it. But then he also needs to be harmed in oh. that specific transaction. Right. And, and I guess I'm incrementally approaching it element by element. So on that first element, would that be enough? If Mr. Freer relied on it in a way that was separate from his status as shareholder, um, in a different transaction for which CLA had knowledge that that was the reason he was going to rely on it, then yes, I would say that that's... Would your what, client maybe have had him sign the engagement letter if they knew he was going to independently take it and rely on it? Yes, I believe it would. Can you talk about that? Well, I mean, generally speaking, I mean, auditors and the whole purpose of an engagement letter is to set forth the responsibilities of the auditor to the client and to set forth the reasons why and why you can rely on um, their work. And generally speaking, if there are situations... Um, that are known, those would be, would in theory, be spelled out. In this case, the only known transaction that CLA was aware of was a potential asset sale of JTF's assets only. Um, and so, you know, I did want to point out that standard charter does not also stand for the proposition that um, a, a plaintiff can recover unlimited consequential damages. I think it's very um, important to read the comments to the restatement that talk about the limitation of liability, which is different in a negligent misrepresentation case than you'd, get, you'd find in, for example, a fraud case or just the run-of-the-mill tort case. The, the, sta uh, the, excuse me, the restatement clearly sets forth what type of damages is allowed, and it clearly states that you need to focus on the specific transaction at issue and harm incurred in the specific transaction that's contemplated here. And um, the specific transaction, like I said previously, was only this asset sale. It wasn't later being sued by a third party um, because, first of all, Mr. Freer was only sued in his individual capacity for his own fraud. Um, liability under 552 does not extend to covering, co you know, covering for a plaintiff's own fraud. It also doesn't extend to, co um, to covering liability for being wrongfully sued by another party for a breach of a warranty that he never made. So, so I wanted to be just very clear that the, the limitation is, is limited, or excuse me, the extent of liability is, is limited there. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit um, more about 552, first of all, um, it also extends to pecuniary loss suffered by the claimant who relies. And so that's also the key. We talked about duty here. Now we're going further and talking about harm. In order to recover under 552, you, uh, Mr. Freer needs to have personally suffered a pecuniary loss. He has not done that here. He's had ample opportunity to put into evidence clear examples of him suffering pecuniary loss. Did but what the fees? I mean, he was sued individually, right? He was sued in, uh, he was sued in his individual capacity for fraud and for right. breach of a warranty that he did not make. Right, right. But he was sued individually, paid, paid fees. Uh... It's not certain that he paid fees. I would submit that the record is not clear that he, the record does not establish that he paid any fees. What the statement of facts says is that he claims to have paid fees, 
But again, he could have submitted an affidavit that said, I paid $20,000 in fees. I personally committed, committed money to the settlement agreement. You don't have that before you. You don't have any piece of evidence that shows that he paid money towards the settlement or towards the cost to defend the Delaware's lawsuit. And I don't think you even, if, for, especially with respect to the defense costs, there's an, another reason, even if he did personally pay anything, which again, I don't believe he has, Freer, or excuse me, CLA's liability under section 552 doesn't extend that far. It doesn't extend to covering the plaintiff for his own fraud. And that's, again, the only reason he that, was sued. That, of course, counsel assumes that it was fraud. You know, that, because I, I mean, ultimately, that I, Mr. Freer's characterization is that CLA did not do its job appropriately, and then he got accused of fraud. So it, it, it seems like that's a, that's a meaningful distinction. Well, there is a distinction also in what was alleged. We have um, one aspect, which was the financial statements that CLA prepared. But the fraud that Mr. Freer engaged in is much broader than that. He um, made verbal and written statements about JTF's business. He manipulated financial statements and provided those to the buyer. He actually prepared um, interim financial statements for 2014 that had nothing to do with CLA. CLA wasn't involved at all and gave those to the buyer. So that's the fraud that I'm talking about here. Even if he, um, I mean, I think that was the focus is that he did these other things independent of whatever was in the gap financial state or the financial statements that were audited by CLA. Um, and so, um, you know, I want to be very clear that there's, there's, we're, we're talking about two kind of different things. We're talking about an injury to Mr. Freer, or his claimed injury that reduced his share value, and he's claiming to be possibly out of pocket, which for which money we don't understand. And so for a variety of reasons here, he has no standing. He has no pecuniary loss. There's no proof in the record that he personally incurred any of these expenses. So with that said, unless there's further questions, Your Honor, I would um, uh, you know, direct you to our the arguments in our brief, and um, thank you for your time. Thank you, counsel. You know what? I'm going to give you 30 seconds because you know it's kind of it was a sporting event. I I heard you say 30, and it well there we go. We're going to put seven. All right, Your Honor. First of all, um, with respect to the idea that somehow him being a shareholder creates some inability on him to to sue for his own personal claims, I would cite Funk v. Spalding, where it says, "quote A stockholder may sue as an individual." where he is directly and individually injured, although the corporation may also have a cause of action for the same wrong. Um, secondly, with respect to the he was uh, not an innocent party and so the collateral source doesn't rule, uh, there was never any finding uh, by any court that he actually committed fraud. And secondly, the no innocent party uh, cases are CERCLA cases. That's the only cases she found, uh, that CLA found were CERCLA cases, not any Arizona authority for that proposition. Uh, third, the idea that they somehow, CLA intended to only benefit uh, C uh, JTF Aviation Holdings because it was an asset purchase agreement. They delivered the um, audit in February of 2014. There was not an asset uh, purchase agreement until June of 2014, several months later. They had no idea how the company was going to be sold. The stipulated facts said they just knew that the, uh, the audit was going to be used in connection with the sale of the company, a potential sale of the company, not the structure the sale would take. Um, and finally, the statement that there's no evidence in the record to support individual damages by Freer is just blatantly incorrect. If you remember, I gave you a citation to a statement of facts filed by CLA with the trial court in which they acknowledged that uh, Freer had only produced documentation showing $40,000 worth of personal expenses. Thank you. Thank, thank you both for your, your excellent arguments. Uh, it was very helpful. And um, we will take it under advisement, have something out in due course. And uh, with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>